Science is a process and yeah. a very slow one. And the fact that a study this year says X, Y, Z doesn't mean that it's going to be the same results as the next studies. And hmm. I, I find that kind of stuff really interesting, but I don't think, I, I think that's like, we're still living in a time that has like kind of religious structure for how we tell our stories. So it's like, it's supposed to be, we found this out and it's the truth and it's hard truth and it's illuminated <laughs> right. and that's it. And that I think we're just kind of breaking out from that. You're listening to another episode of Faith Deficit, a weekly program that explores individual stories of faith in an increasingly secular world. So my guest today is Becky Ferreira. Becky's a freelance science reporter with Bylines and Motherboard, Wired, Popular Science, New Scientist, and Sparknotes. Uh, you can find her work on Twitter at Becky Ferreira. Uh, and she's also someone I've known a long time, so I'm really thrilled to have her today. How are you, Becky? I'm great. How are you? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I'm good. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, hey, anytime. Uh, so <laughs> I wanted to start a little bit with your background. So I know you're uh, you're Canadian. That's kind of how we knew each other. You live in New York now, uh, mm-hmm. or New York State. Um, and did you grow up, when you grew up, you grew up in like Alberta, right? Edmonton? Yeah, Edmonton. Yeah. Um, did you grow up with religion? Like what was it like kind of for you growing up? I grew up like pretty with a pretty militant atheist family, actually, like not even just atheists because there was no religion in our house, but just um, both my parents had had bad experiences with it. And especially Mm. my dad had a lot of resentment from growing up uh, in a Catholic boarding school. And just like, you know, he had he had a sense of being robbed of many years of of development there. So um, there was like sort of a personal antipathy against religion. Um, Yeah. And uh, very like a, a very pro science, pro pragmatism kind of a, of environment. And um, I think my mom tried to like take us a couple times to church or something, and it it wasn't it didn't didn't stick very well. <laughs> like just like kind of like yeah, she was just like, well, let's go through the motions. Yeah. So, us. so what was it like like for you being a kid in that environment, and, and you know, other kids are celebrating, let's say Christmas or Hanukkah or whatever was it just sort of were you just like yeah I don't really believe in any of that were you curious yeah no I was I I think that it was kind of mixed because I think I had like this sense of superiority like that um our family had figured out something and everybody else was uh, uh, getting conned and scammed and stuff like that so I think I had like a little bit of a a bad attitude about it and like I would look down on people who are religious even if they're my friends when I was a little kid but I was also kind of jealous of them um, right. cause I think that I always like had an attraction to the idea of the supernatural. And, um, even if I didn't want to believe it literally, it like, it was interesting to me. And it's also just the community aspect. I think I always really liked kind of religious ritual rituals and like the idea of going to, uh, either, you know, a temple or a church to be around your community and talk about ideas, um, was like always something that I, I kind of was jealous that religious people got to do and that there was not really the same forum. Um, so that kind of like right. got tangled out in adolescence and stuff like that. But, but I would say like, that's, that's one of the negatives of like kind of growing up without, um, you know, w- like in a, in a, in a very um, scientific minded kind of environment where not a lot of our friends or family was religious is that I think that I didn't really have it humanized for me very well. <laughs> and uh Right, like they, uh, because the way they talk to you about religion was like it's not, uh, it doesn't make any sense, and yeah. if you believe it, you're probably not super smart or whatever it is, right? Like yeah, they positioned like it as like actively, it's like actively in contrast to science. Like it's like we're right. the science team kind of thing. Like and um, so that's right. like, I think I think that's pretty common with a lot of secular societies. Like the you know it, millennial people growing up in those secular societies probably had a lot of don't get caught in this scam kind of, um, right. you know, like instruction in their childhoods and stuff. Yeah. Like it's is, interesting. Cause yeah, for me, like I, I grew up, you know, Jewish in a, in a, mm-hmm. in a pretty, um, uh, I, I want to say like Christian when I was like a kid, you know, I grew up in a neighborhood that was, that was pretty waspy. And mm-hmm. so what I always felt was kind of this feeling of like, everyone else knows the words to a song that I don't, know anything about. <laughs> right. you know what I mean like 
They're all like, and literally, like they would sing Christmas carols, and I'd be like, mm, <laughs> I don't really. <laughs> so your parents didn't like do any of the Christmas stuff. We did Christmas when I was a little kid. Did mm-hmm. you do Christmas? Were you like a Christmas person? Yeah, yeah, no? definitely. It was just like yeah. we, and we would have a nativity scene, but we would just be like there to be made fun of. You know? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the Jesus fish getting eaten by bigger yeah. darling fishes or something. Um, so then yeah. it's interesting you, you mentioned Supernatural because uh, just looking through your writing on Motherboard and some of the other publications, it's I feel like you have a uh, a pretty fun approach to science writing. Like you approach it with kind of an eye towards um, aliens and, you know, conspiracy theories. And, uh, you know, you have a piece about secret vault and the great pyramid of Giza. So it's sort of <laughs> like yeah. you have this sort of fun, like approach to science. Like, I wonder if that's you kind of exploring that background, but in a way that's still a little mystical or I don't know like yeah I'm kind of no about definitely that. I, yeah I, I wouldn't say it's like so much mystical as like I think um Carl Sagan had a had a great quote of saying like that's that spirituality is you know not in conflict with science it's actually like a science is a big catalyst for spirituality so it's more like mm. the spiritual side because I feel like mysticism kind of goes I find it interesting but it kind of goes against my wiring the idea of like well if we don't have a good enough explanation yet a good story will satisfy that for a little while. And it's just like, I don't have right. that brain, <laughs> but I can, <laughs> um, but I, I, I do think that like when people like religious epiphany and like those kinds of illuminative moments in, you know, uh, liturgy and, and, and church histories and stuff like that, everybody goes through those. Dep- it's it, those, those are just like things that moments that are connected to whatever makes kind of your brain release a bunch of dopamine. So I feel like I'm going through the same things that religious people go through when they feel like God is within them or whatever. When I write about those scientific, uh, uh, like mysteries or, or in Hmm. the case of like secret chambers and stuff like that, where it's just like, we don't, that exists, we don't know what it is. And it's just like, the question is really fun. And I think that, you know, that is also mirrored in religion where it's like tension over the questions that are unresolved. And, um, those kinds of like impulses are the same. Do you think that's a common, do you think that's a common um, sentiment among religious people? Like, do you think that religious people are reveling in uh, that, like, solving mysteries and, and getting answers to questions? Like, because I feel like faith in and of itself is sort of demands a certain level of, like, acquiescence to not knowing what yeah. is happening in the world. Right, right. <laughs> and, yeah. and, but like, you know, in, in Jewish faith, um, just from my background, mm-hmm. there was always kind of a, a, a willingness or a desire to debate and question. And, and there were different theories about what was in the Bible. And there's always like that underlying assumption that, you know, that's, it's true, but like with the caveat that, but you can interpret it this way or this way. And maybe it meant this. And, do you think that's like, do you think that's something that religious people really get joy from is, is that exploration? I, I just think it's like, there's, it really depends because there's just so many different manifestations of it. And it's funny, mm-hmm. you know, one of the, uh, when I was like learning a little bit more about Judaism, I thought it, um, it was really interesting, the Midrash period, and I, I'm, I'm probably going to get it wrong, but just the whole idea that like, in the Middle Ages, Jews mm-hmm. kind of unpinned uh, the idea of literal, biblical um interpretation so that there could be a little bit more wiggle room for those kinds of questions that are fun. And so much Mm. a part of like Jewish culture is like questioning and, um, uh, and like having kind of ironic tales and things like that. So Mm. I think if, if you have, if you're talking about a religion like Judaism, there's like a lot more space than if you were talking about something like Southern Baptist or something like that, where I think that there's probably a little bit more dogmatic approach. And again, I don't want to generalize like everybody, but, um, I think that um, it really is like mm. there are scientific people that are really dogmatic in their thinking and that right. don't actually question the structure. And then there's religious people that, you know, like it's part of the mystery of God to them. And I, I think that's like really what it comes down to is that the difference to me between religious people and secular atheist thinkers is just that like religious people need to like personify the universe somehow. They need it to be like a person. And it's right. not really a huge difference when you look at it like that, I think the way that you relate to the universe doesn't like, it doesn't matter that much. If you think it's like 
a person <laughs> or if right, you just think right. like I do that it's like we don't know really what it is um, right. and that's kind of fun and I, I do take it on faith that uh, you know what has been found out so far uh, is accurate it could be overturned by new evidence but you know right now that's all I can do is be like okay I guess we're in a 13 billion year old weird universe <laughs> right, that's, right. What we got. Right. That's, that's what that's we, what we know. know yeah so, like, <laughs> yeah. so like you, you know um uh yeah it's it's interesting because it's like i i feel like there's something about uh eighth when i think of like atheism versus like agnosticism like there's something about atheism that, that there's a certain degree of certainty or yeah I, I forget who said this i don't know if it was like dawkins or someone like that but they're saying i'm pa- totally paraphrasing but um the idea that um if you don't need evidence to believe something, um, then uh, if you don't have evidence, you can you 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 can choose not to believe it. In other words, like you know, people say, "Well, God might exist. I don't have any proof, but you know, you don't know he doesn't." And then the contrary argument would be, you know, well, we don't we have no reason to actually believe that unless we were to have proof. In other words, like you need right. some kind of evidence to to feel that that's totally. the case. Yeah. Um, you know, but if you like, if you, w- when you look into the universe there and you were saying like, we don't need, you know, you don't really like to have myths in place of information you don't know. Um, yeah. I guess I'm just thinking like, are there, are there areas where you think like, Hey, there, could, there could be ghosts or, you know what I mean? Like it's a thing that possibly could exist. Or are you just like, no, like I, I, it's, it's just a myth that people create to not, to, to try to understand phenomena that they don't. I yeah, think, definitely. Yeah. I, I think, but I think that's interesting in itself that we see ghosts and things like that. And I'm sure that there's a lot of people who have seen things that, um, you know, they don't think are, uh, is not explicable in any obvious way, but they interpret it however they want. Right. Mm-hmm. And, um, mm-hmm. I mean, there are definitely things I have wacky theories that I wouldn't say that are absolutely true, but you know, sometimes it does feel like we live in a computer simulation or something like that. <laughs> right, where it's like, right. I have no, I have no proof, but, um, except for the fact that occasionally I see two people wearing the same shit and it's like glitch in the matrix or something like that, you know, <laughs> right. those moments that I think we all have where we're like, this isn't yeah. real. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And you know, just the history of science itself, I think we take it for granted how crazy each new truth has been where it's like, right. you know, people were assuming if you take Western canon, like that it was 6,000 years old, the earth and everything like that. And in the 1800s, when you have geologists and evolutionary biologists coming out being like, no, it's millions to billions. It's just like, that's, we're so used to that now, but that's crazy how wrong our (laughs) estimate of the age of the earth was. And then, you know, um, so I think that science is just filled with ideas that are so to me, they, you know, religion hasn't really been able to rival it in terms of like, genuinely scintillating and like tantalizing information where and I honestly think like like there's a lot of overlap that could be going on between science and religion right now that I you know I hope to see more in coming generations because I think like science is is affirming some pretty essential religious truths if you look at Buddhist religion or something like that like there's Mm. there's definite overlap in the philosophies um of what's going on. And, and, and I think we all do have like this need to worship too. So, right. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, mean I, I love crazy theories and I, and yeah, I love yeah, myths, yeah. you know, I really love, I think myths say a lot about a culture and a, and a people, but yeah, I don't yeah, like, wanna, it does like, feel like that, that sort of like, like that dances through your writing. Like you have, you do oh, talk thanks. about ghosts and you do talk about like you, there, there's stuff that comes through that feels like, that fiction side where, where you have a bit of fun with like scientific discoveries. Like you take, you know, eye surgery or bionic eyes and you turn that into like, we could fire lasers from our eyes. Like I think, <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny because yeah. yeah, totally. I mean, it, in some ways, like that's a funny example of an article. Cause I wasn't totally on board with that treatment just because mm. it was like, sometimes I feel like that's a area of science communication where you have to do the most kind of sensationalist thing. Um, right. and, I, and I try to steer away from it now a little bit more just because right. it's 
and and I, it kind of bums the researchers out a lot of the time because they're like, we got to sell to Lays. Like, we don't want to shoot lasers out of people's eyeballs. We just want to, like, cure cancer. <laughs> and, um, I've had that happen, too, by the way, with, like, pieces I've written. And then <laughs> the headline is totally different than what <laughs> yeah, I intended. Exactly. Exactly, right? <laughs> they're like, should, yeah. should, I, should every conservative be burned at the stake? Like, I definitely didn't <laughs> say that. <laughs> I was like, why? <laughs> now that's a loaded question, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, like it's that it's like it, it. I get, I get that because I feel like you know a study will come out and it'll be like we discovered a slightly different protein in an egg than we thought right. was there, and then the headline will be like eggs will kill you, and you're like, how did you get like? There's still years totally. of research to do, and that's why that's why people flip flop so much on on scientific issues. You're like, oh, I. I thought that it was bad, but it's good now. It's like, it's not that simple. It's so nuanced. And the discoveries are meaningful, but they're meaningful in a way that like, it's hard, it's very hard to explain to a lay person, which is kind of what your job is, like explaining mm -hmm. to someone like me, something that may be much more complicated than my like capacity to really understand it. Yeah, way, I mean, right? it's, it's beyond um, my capacity. That's why I have to talk to people who know it much better than me. <laughs> you know, like, right, right. I, it, it's just uh, like, that's one of that's my favorite part of the job usually is just reading the papers of these people where you get the specialized language you get what you know it's it's the part that most i think science popular science readers don't do is is kind of um see how imperfect the study is and how and how willing the scientists mm. are to be like these are you know every scientific paper has their methods section where they talk about the limitations of what their methods were and you're not going to report that in your normally you're not going to report that in your thing because it's like not sexy to be like, by the way, like this was all <laughs> computer simulated. They didn't actually right. go like to Pluto and do these monitoring things or whatever. Right. Um, so it's like, it's like a tricky balance and, and I, and you want to get people interested at the same time as like try to impart what I think is the missing thing with the public, which is science as a process and yeah. a very slow one. And the fact that, a study this year says X, Y, Z doesn't mean that it's going to be the same results as the next studies. And hmm. I, I find that kind of stuff really interesting, but I don't think, I, I think that's like, we're still living in a time that has like kind of religious structure for how we tell our stories. So it's like, it's supposed to be, we found this out and it's the truth and it's hard truth and it's illuminated <laughs> right. and that's it. And that I think we're just kind of breaking out from that. And I, and I do think actually cons like science news consumers are really sick of sensationalism mm -hmm. now. And they are much more, in my experience, they're much more willing to try to um, focus with you and go along with the actual story, you know? Interesting. So you think people have, have started to say, uh, like, we don't, we don't need you to tell us that this is, you know, this is going to be like the next huge scientific innovation. Yeah. Like, we just need to know what's... Yeah, I, I, that might be like related to news fatigue in general, the way that news is right. always kind of highlighted those sensationalist tactics. And so I, I think like science is just not an exception from that. And people get really tired of, um, you know, coverage that doesn't, you know, that often doesn't even highlight the most interesting thing about a study. It just is, buries the lead all the time, you know, um, yeah. like I do report a lot on alien stuff, but I right. find it more of an interesting thing as a cultural issue because aliens is not really a very scientific subject. <laughs> like we have one data set, we have one data set of what a life form, you know, what a, a life system on a planet looks like. Um, that's not very much <laughs> to go off of. But I mean, it, so we have it, tons of testimony from countless people. <laughs> oh my gosh. Who have been, right. <laughs> well, that who like ties into the ghost thing. <laughs> you know, like it's just, it's more fascinating to me that that's, such a thing that people, you know, people do have like these experiences that they attribute to aliens. And right. I think that is very faith based. And it's, it's interesting that, you know, there are scientific realm kind of topics that are bleeding into religion. And I love that, but I don't actually know that that's a long term net good or, or bad or anything. I just think it's interesting. Well, it's also I mean, one thing, Laura and I were talking about this, my wife, Laura, and I were talking about this. Uh, and uh she was saying that she feels like there is a relationship between uh, some of these myths and 
periods of anxiety. So, you know, mm. the alien stuff came along, you know, in the in the 50s and 60s when there was, you know, a lot of fear around nuclear war and a lot of, you know, uh, there was the cold, the cold war had started, you know what I mean? So there was a lot of like anxiety around stuff and you started to see in area 51 and all this stuff like started to come up all of a sudden. And and the more, the more it happened, the more it kind of amplified. And, you know, you'd see, you see myths around Bigfoot and, you know, werewolves and all kinds of stuff. And you can maybe track them a little bit to like cultural shifts or moments where, as you said before, the myth serves to either provide a comfort or provide some kind of answer or, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's, it's, it's a really interesting phenomenon. And then we all, you know, and then you start to see people perceive things like they perceive, they, they see, suddenly you're seeing something, you're like, oh, an alien exists. And then you see a light in the sky and you're like, oh, oh, I wonder if that's, yeah. I wonder if that's a UFO. Like you would never have thought that before, you know. Totally. It just seeps into the cultural consciousness that that's like a possibility. And then there's a framework for it. I like yeah. that Laura's point a lot. Like, I think you can definitely, that's why like the history of religion is so interesting is that you can see the new myths kind of um, emerging when there's a need for them, you know, like, I, it's not an accident that Christianity comes out of a time of Roman oppression of Jewish people, right? Like, right. Right, <laughs> it's, right. Um, it's not an accident that it, it becomes a major religion when Constantine decides, oh, this is what I'm going to do now. Like, it's, uh, it's really cool to see, I think, not just in terms of religious ideas, but just ideologies in general, um, you know, get crashed into the open by certain events in, in history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, so, so I mean, does that... Uh, when, when, so when you're writing, I guess one of the sort of central questions I'm trying to explore here is like, what what is kind of your motivation like what is it that like what you were talking about before do you have that kind of feeling like a sort of epiphany when you think about new discoveries when you read about new is that kind of your faith in a way or is that your is that kind of what drives you in terms of your work and your your life in general like where's your is that where your moral code comes from like i'm just kind of wondering oh okay um you know what i mean i don't know if it's where i i guess like it's related to my moral code because i think that you know objective truth is about as good of a backbone to build your morality um, around as you can, uh, such mm-hmm. as it exists, objective truth, not that right. science is like a perfect um, system for, you know, um, digging that kind of truth up, but um, it's certainly like to me the best system. So I think I love, I love my position in the hierarchy of like science dissemination, because I really like trying to, as much as possible to, uh, share the experience scientists have and their perspective on their work um, mm. in, in, and make it fun for people. Like it's just, to me, it's just like mind blowing all the time. Like, and I think I'm very lucky that my job is literally to always talk to people who are the smartest in their field in a very hard field um, and, and learn from them and try to make that something that someone else is excited about. It's not hard for me to be um, passionate about it because I just think, science is really interesting as a process. I think scientists have interesting lives a lot of the time and interesting perspectives. And then on top of that, what science reveals is so weird (laughs) that it really doesn't (laughs) need a lot of like, if you, if you report science, right, I think you don't really need to embellish it at all. Like it's, you know, uh, you were reporting the giving the um, secret chamber study um, as an example. I mean, this is a thing where um, like, particles hitting the atmosphere are revealing a secret chamber that has never been opened inside of the world's famous, most famous monument. (laughs) And it's just like, I I don't think you need to sex that up at all. Like that's just (laughs) so crazy. Right. Um, Right. Right. And and I think, I think like I want people to, uh, to have confidence that even though science and STEM fields are often portrayed as like for nerds and you have to be so so smart and you have to have been on the right right life track to get them. It's not true. It's not that hard to understand, um, you know, obviously, if you want to, like, get into, like, serious physics and stuff, that that's going to be beyond even anyone's power, except for the people who are in that field, right? But, like, mm-hmm. to actually understand um, the point of why this research was done, um, the exciting revelations that come from it, I think that, I think people, like, really sell themselves short on it. And I really want to be, like, someone who's a confidence booster, like, you get, you get this, and this is useful for you, right. you know? Well, I think I one of the things you question, do, 
Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things you do, I think, is you are able to tie scientific discoveries uh, or moments to something relatable. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm thinking right now of you had written that piece about, and maybe you can talk a little bit about that piece, if you don't mind, about the volcano in Hawaii and the, the observatory. Oh, yeah. Right? Or the, sorry, this the observatory is, in Hawaii. Yeah. Yeah, no, this is a great example, actually, because I think this was like a big paradigm shift for myself um, in terms of thinking about faith-based issues and things like that, because this was like, so, so the backstory is that the 30 meter telescope, it's, it's very a huge telescope. Um, it's the only one that's larger in construction right now is um, one going down in Chile. Uh, it's just like, it could, it could do so much for science. And it was selected to be built on top of Mauna Kea uh, in Hawaii, which is a sacred mountain. It already has a lot of telescopes on it. And, um, many uh, indigenous Hawaiians, as well as just environmentalists, were like, "This is it. We don't want to have any more um, telescopes built on on this sacred land. You know, um, you're messing up this like worship site." And it was really hard because, you know, it's just so complicated. There's, of course, like a lot of indigenous Hawaiians who are like, "Our history is astronomy. We should have more astronomy." You know, it's it's not one sided mm. on any of these sides, and the telescope operators are very sensitive they're not saying like oh these guys are dumb or anything for for not wanting to have a more um construction it's very it's very shades of gray and i think that i came out of it being like this is not so much a science versus religion kind of a problem as a science versus colonialism kind of an issue which is a mm -hmm. big problem i think for science in terms of institutional failures to um recognize genius outside of the mainstream you know right and uh, so it really, it really moved me. And I, and I went, you know, and also it's just like, I went there and I was like, I could see why you would be protective over this ridiculously beautiful mountain. If the, you know, um, it's extremely powerful to be on Mauna Kea. Like it's <laughs> really right. obvious um, that it's a special place. And it's just, uh, I have like enormous empathy for people who want to, stop what they see as a colonial scientific enterprise um mm. from from being on that but it's at the same time you know it's like it is one of the best places in the whole world to have a telescope and it's certainly right. arguably the best in the northern hemisphere which is why they had to build there as opposed to in chile where we already have a lot of those kinds of telescopes and not so many sacred um land issues so mm -hmm. it was it was it was big in terms of kind of I don't know. I think that because I was raised so much with this idea that science and religion and colonialism are all kind of these separate issues and they're really not, <laughs> it's really difficult right. to report right. on that. And I also like when I was, I was lucky enough to hang out with some of the protesters that were at the, um, that were at the mountain that day and they were watching hearings about the 30 meter telescope. And, um, you know, they're talking about like their, their native Hawaiian culture and stuff. And, um, there's a lot of things that are just like, so dovetail nicely in with, uh, scientific ideas in terms of, um, native Hawaiian philosophy and, um, you know, like a lot about sustainability, obviously Hawaiians are very good at being sustainable. Otherwise they couldn't live in the middle of the right, ocean with right. no, uh, you know, so they have learned, they've learned the hard way about the fact that you need to take care of the earth if you want to prosper on it. And right. I just find it all really sympathetic. So I think that we're just having trouble, like talking past each other, you know, and I think they'll, especially like, because a lot of scientists, um, may not even like have those kinds of, um, I don't know, this, that, that kind of point of view of like, this is like, science is very colonial and it's a problematic past, right. you know, and, and, and exclusionary. Too, we, we have a, we have a certain idea of how like one does science and totally, uh, but we, but then you can look at advances that have happened in different ways um you know or in different uh like contexts different cultures different his you know the different times and be like oh wow like look, look what people were able to discover or figure out and then how do we work backwards and understand that discovery you know what i mean like how do we yeah you know it's, it's almost like on the one hand you need to some kind of methodology to determine what's true and what's not true. On the other hand, you have to be open enough to, to be able to look at something and say, 
even though they didn't follow our methodology, they still came to this conclusion. So like, how do we understand that? Like, how do we understand that the thing they're doing is working? Like, how do we work back and try to, you know, break down like that this natural remedy like works or that, you know, like that, that, mm -hmm. that, you know, there is a, there's a balanced ecosystem here that we don't seem to understand exactly how to, you know. Yeah, exactly. It's, it brings me back to that um, amazing uh, Jeff Goldblum, Ian Malcolm speech in Jurassic Park, <laughs> of course, which is like, honestly, like probably the crux of yeah. <laughs> philosophical scientific, uh, you know, awakening and, and the um, maybe the Jurassic crux of Park and like our, both of our sexual awakenings too. <laughs> 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 it's true he is he's truly yes. phenomenal in all ways he is he's yeah. an agent of illumination in the world <laughs> um so but just like the fact that there there's that scene where he's talking about what is discovery but the right. rape of the natural world and i think that's pretty extreme but there but he's making a point that i think is extremely important like that science is has been in many ways a thing that has destroyed societies and right. has not been ha, has has taken the pursuit for truth at all you know at all costs kind of an as an idea and I think that's very much like changing and has always been there's always been detractors of of searching for truth at all costs but I think that's it's it, it opens itself up for criticism mm -hmm. as an institution when it does that and when it's you get the great you know um, flowering of debate over the uh, limits and regulation of science when you right. get into the nuclear age. And it's like, you know, it, 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 you can debate whether the bomb should have been invented all you want, but it was because science is right. going to go and invent things, right. whether or not that's the thing that you should do. And so I think there's, and I think religious people should be involved in that conversation and should not be excluded from it because there's so right. many valuable viewpoints there that can be mediators and to make, to make science not just better at telling truth, but better and more accessible and more in, yeah, engaged I mean, I with think, the public. Yeah, I think it's true. You know? I think that if you look at even innovations right now, like if you look at how how cryptocurrency is being used as a commodity, and it's like maybe there's a potential for sure. cryptocurrency to have a real impact on the developing world and how people um, use and spend money. I mean, maybe there's something there, but... Uh, you know, in blockchain, but but the the because of how mm -hmm. this particular algorithm is used, it's sort of I would say perverted a little bit in the context of like this kind of intense need to uh, make a ton of money in, in a short amount of time, basically. Um, and I I think you need exactly. you need people to yeah. be able to step back yeah. and say, okay, let's look at let's look at the social context of this. Let's look at um, more than just you know, what, how can we, you know, use this, but like, what, what, what are the ethics around it? What is, how does this affect our society? You know? Um, and, and I, I guess that, that kind of makes me think it's kind of interesting for you maybe to have had that growth, uh, from being young and like the way you, you know, not to put words in your mouth, but maybe looking down a little bit on other people, uh, from the background that you had, mm -hmm to maybe now having a bit more of a nuanced view where you're still someone who's fascinated by science, but maybe in also fascinated by science in the, in the larger context of, you know, uh, like you said, colonialism and uh, religion and um, mythology. And so like, yeah. how, you know, understanding science, not just for the pure discovery of it, but for how it, how it functions within our larger society, yeah. what it means, you know, yeah. Who's it for? You know, it's, 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 yeah, it, it totally, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a fascinating topic. Yeah. Um, and did. Uh, did you see hidden figures? Yeah. I, I thought, yeah. I, I thought the movie had some problems, but I think it's just like, so I think that's just like crazy to think about that the same people who were figuring out how to get men to the moon yeah. had a segregated, yeah. <laughs> had such a regressive social policy. And it's not like all the white people were like, oh yeah, black people should be segregated. You know, there was like a lot of uh, white allies and everything like that is a complicated situation. No, yeah. I don't want to paint them all with a, a broad brush there, but just the, just the, the um, juxtaposition of such high thinking with such low thinking. And I, and I, I think that's really indicative of like, you know, the yeah. challenges that science faces, like is, is science, um, justified in chasing these kinds of truths if it results in like 
uh, world inequity and massive yeah. suffering and stuff like that. I don't have the answer right. to that. You know, it's just that there are well, questions that everyone you know, like, should be involved in. Th- there's a certain, there's an alternate timeline, <laughs> you know, where, where the, the many millions of people that have been excluded from a scientific pursuit because they were women or people of color or, you know, mm-hmm. let's say Jews in Germany in the 1940s or whatever it is, right? Millions of people who are unable to pursue that right. path, like what, you know, what, uh, imagining what they could have discovered, how they could have contributed to that conversation, what they could have seen um, uh, that, 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 totally. that the tradition, you know, for many years, the traditional idea of a scientist would have blinders on because of a cultural context or because of uh, political or religious prejudices. And and I think it's like, you know, we look at science as the most sort of objective, you know, um, methodology, like, but, but of course, like, it, it has to exist in, in a cultural context, it has to exist in, um, uh, you know, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So it's hidden figures. It's a human invention, you know, it's, yeah. it's the best that we've got. It's like democracy in that way. It's yeah. riddled with flaws, well, but it, it's the best that we got. There's a great. No, no um, I was just going to say, you know, sorry, even even looking at how research is done, or how people choose, you know, who to who to study, or who to ask questions, or how questions are asked. Like, there's so many different areas, so many variables yeah. where one thing changes. And anyway, yeah. So you were saying. I just want to, there, there's a great Stephen Jay Gould um, quote about this, and he's kind of like my spirit right. animal on a lot of these questions, but he said um, that he's less interested in the weight of Einstein's brain than the near certainty that people of equal talent have lived and died in right. sweatshops and cotton fields, which I just think is, that's like, I, I, I feel that sometimes like on such a deep despair note, like to think about the brain's the minds that have been lost. It's just so incalculable and such a lesson for the future. Um, And uh, I mean, I I do, I do believe in like the um, human ability to create uh, not, if not a utopia, a sustainable system. Like I I believe it's possible and um, but it's not going to happen without utilizing (laughs) every brain (laughs) that we have. Like we just are not smart enough to only educate some of us and have it expected yeah. to work out well. Like it's, you know, it's, it must be equality yeah. of science education. And on that note, which is a wonderful note. Um, maybe I'll just see if there's anything you are working on right now that you wanted to share. Well, right now I'm working on a series for motherboard called humans of the year, which is a really fun profile series of um, people who are maybe not like, you know, Nobel prize or Capley prize uh, at that level of their careers yet, but are just kind of starting in an interesting field or they're, they, they have um, done something really new that, that wouldn't normally put them on the radar of, of awards. So I, I would recommend checking that out, out on um, Motherboard. I have some great people. Um, Shutez Cat Martinez is a climate change activist who's suing the government. He's a teenage rapper that's doing that. Um, we have a robot sex expert. Of course, you got to have that. It's Motherboard. Sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and, and just that kind of, um, you know, it's, it's really fun to profile people who are new uh doing new stuff you know like that maybe are not yeah. have a whole like research background yet but they're they're doing the next line of of work so check that out yeah that's awesome well thank you so much becky that was really a great conversation and i appreciate it um and my pleasure yeah, i love talking time. about this stuff you know that <laughs> I do. get more into dinosaurs <laughs> next time and the religion of dinosaurs that i want to start the dinosaur cult <laughs> <laughs> what's it what's the name of the religion um let's call Di- it saurian this dino saucers maybe yeah. we can do like a space, dino space. uh yes well i'll develop that. that a little bit more <laughs> yeah work on it work on it for next time <laughs> okay thanks Church of t-rex <laughs> yeah yeah thank you for listening you can find our website at faithdeficit.com Faith Deficits, recorded and produced in Guelph, Ontario at Domo Studios. Music by Jeremy Volts. You can hear more of his music at jeremyvolts.com. If you've been enlightened by this week's episode of Faith Deficit, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and provide an iTunes review. You can also support the program on Patreon, and if you do, thanks so much. I'm Josh Bowen, and this is Faith Deficit. 